All right, here we are with the Lab 10 generalization assignment. The assignment is really one big thing that's gonna be fairly similar to your semester long project. Your task is to obtain data from this paper and do a reproducible analysis. Specifically, we will uh, do t-tests on uh, the data that we get from this paper. We're going to reproduce a graph of the means and we're going to do a power curve analysis. If you want to uh, get the paper, you can follow that link and download the article here, and you can get the data in CSV format here. This link took us to chapter 10 in uh, the lab manual that I wrote for an undergraduate statistics course. Uh, you could read this to get a general understanding of what happened in this paper. Briefly, I will say uh, it is called Stand by Your Stroop, Standing Up Enhances Selective Attention and Cognitive Control. If you're familiar with the Stroop effect, um, here are some example items. In a Stroop task, you will see one of these items, usually one at a time, and you'll be asked to say the color of the ink as fast as you can. So here the answer would be red, here the answer would be blue. And notice the congruent item types, the word and the color are the same. And typically your responses to the ink color are faster for these kinds of items. When the word and color are, are mismatched or incongruent, your responses are typically slower. So the Stroop effect is slower responding in these conditions compared to this condition. If we look at the paper and we scroll down, we're going to be analyzing the results from experiment three. In this experiment, the participants did a Stroop task while sitting in a chair, like me, or standing up. And the authors reported that the size of the difference, that is the Stroop effect, the difference between incongruent and congruent stimuli, was smaller when people were standing and larger when people were sitting. And this could indicate that when people are standing, they may be paying more attention to the, the colors, I suppose, and per potentially better able to ignore the distracting word, in which case they might be a little bit faster in this more difficult incongruent condition. Uh, the data can be obtained by following this link. Uh, oops, sorry, I guess it's, is it that link? I think it's actually this one here under the blue badge, HTTPS, you can go here and get the data. It's another way to get it. When we look at the results for experiment three, we see that they're reported beginning right here. Uh, the authors report statistics looking at uh, overall trends. They actually use a repeated measure as ANOVA, which we won't do in this class. They report two t-tests. So they say the Stroop effect in both the sitting condition. So here's a t-test. Uh, so the sitting condition refers to this condition and the Stroop effect is this difference here. So the difference between this mean and that mean was uh, significant according to a uh, their alpha criterion. And they also report a t-test for the standing condition, which is the difference between this mean and that mean. So we're going to obtain the data and conduct both of these t-tests. These are paired sample t-tests because uh, participants participated <laughs> in uh, all of the conditions. That is, they received congruent and incongruent stimuli, and they did the standing, con standing condition and the sitting condition. The critical uh, experimental finding wasn't that there were Stroop effects. It's not that the congruent bars were faster than the incongruent bars. It was that the size of the difference, that is the Stroop effect for standing, this difference here was smaller than this difference here. It's hard to see that, but the difference between these two bars is a little bit smaller than the difference between these two bars. They provided statistical evidence for that difference in the form of a two by two interaction. Uh, two by two interactions is a topic that we will get into next semester. 
However, we will see in this lab that we can convert the data uh, into a paired sample t-test to address this very same question. So let's turn to the lab. And I've already got an RMD set up for this. And I've completed the lab. I'm going to walk through the code. The code will be linked to uh, as a solution uh, in the main materials. So first of all, I want to reproduce as much of the analysis as I can using only paired sample t-tests. So the first code chunks will do that. I've loaded some libraries that I'm going to be using later. And the first step is to load the data. Uh, this happens to be a CSV file, so I can load it in. Now, of course, the real first step would be to go and get the data. I've shown you some links you can go to get it. What I've done is I uh, place the data file, stroopstand.csv, into a folder called open data, and I'm addressing it here. It's usually a good idea to open up your data files and take a look at them to see what's going on in there. So if we were to do that, we can see that this is a CSV file and it appears to have uh, some different columns and there's 51 rows. I'm seeing congruent stand, incongruent stand, congruent sit, incongruent sit, and a bunch of numbers that look like reaction times. Not terribly complicated and we can load it right in to R using the read.csv function. Now, uh, we can see the data more clearly here. I'm just doing a couple of double checks and I see that there's 50 rows. That's consistent with the paper. For example, uh, when they were reporting t-tests, we saw that the degrees of freedom was 49, indicating that there was 50 total subjects in those conditions. And they also say, probably somewhere, that n was 50. So these things are good to double check. So the first thing that I want to do is compute the Stroop effect for the standing condition. Now I've done that here. Um, I've addressed the column in the all data data frame uh, that contains the incongruent stand data. So that would be uh, all of these values in this column. And I'm I want to do a paired sample t-test comparing to the data in the congruent stand column. That's these ones. So for each subject, I want to know was the reaction time, the mean reaction time for the more difficult incongruent stimuli larger than the reaction time for the congruent stimuli over here. So for this subject, we can see that there is a, a larger difference. If, if I was just to take these values and subtract them, rather than enter them into a t-test function. What we'd be looking at here are individuals. We have 50 different scores now. And these are the sizes of the Stroop effect for each person. So this is how, sl how slow everyone is in terms of milliseconds for the incongruent items compared to the congruent items. And just by looking at these values, you could see that they're almost all positive, except for this one person. So that means that of 50 people, 49 people showed um, a positive Stroop effect. That is, they were slower when the word and color mismatch compared to when the word and color matched. Now, um, we can put the RTs for the incongruent items and the congruent items into this t-test function set paired to true as we've done and we can get our t-test. Uh, so we've obtained 14.327 as the t-value degrees of freedom 49 and a very tiny p-value with an average mean difference of 95 and we can just compare that over here for the standing condition. Let's see what we find um, right up here. The T value is 14.327 and the P value is very small. They just put 0 0.01. It's smaller than that, but we can see it's very small with the same degrees of freedom. So we were successful in reproducing the T test for the standing items.
moving on to the sitting items, we'll do the same thing. And uh, we'll just address the incongruent sit column, which is over here, and subtract the congruent sit column and put that into a variable and run the t-test at the same time. So remember, if we put the parentheses outside this entire statement, we will both print the results of the t-test to the console and write the contents of the t-test function to a variable containing a list of, of information about the t-test. So here we got a t-value of 16.56, and let's just double check that and or sorry 16.516 rounds up to 52 and so we can see that we were able to um, duplicate or reproduce the t-test from this paper for both t-tests that were conducted and uh, in my analysis what i've done is i've just copied the t-test results directly from the paper and i've showed an example of rewriting them using our own analysis and in this case uh, I've used the Papaja library or package because it contains something called the APA underscore print function. And notice what I've done. I've taken the variable containing the t-test for the sit stroop condition, and I put that variable inside the APA print function, and I've asked it to print out the full result. And so that gives me the mean difference some confidence intervals, and the t-test. So when I finally run the, uh, when I knit my document and scroll down, what I'm seeing here in my reproducible, reproducible report is the code that I'm using to run the t-test. I'm seeing um, ba basic R printouts for the t-test that could be useful for notes later. And I'm showing an example of writing those results to a document. So this was written by hand, copied from the original article, and this is an example of using the APA print function to automate the process of writing down results. Now here, the results are slightly different from what the authors presented. Um, the authors calculated a Cohen's D, and in this case, what's automated is a mean difference, 95% confidence interval, and the T value. Um, some of this stuff can be modified. Uh, if you take a look at the APA print function, there's a few different options in here for things that you might want to report. And you could write your own version of a function like this as well. All right, so an advanced issue here is to complete the analysis, ask the critical question, is the Stroop effect in this condition actually smaller than the Stroop effect in the sitting condition, so standing versus sitting. In order to do this, we need to compare uh, two different Stroop effects. So in order to do that, we need to generate the Stroop scores for individual subjects in the standing condition. So I've done that here by finding the difference between incongruent and congruent for each subject in the standing condition. Those are all the differences. I've saved them in this variable, st stand Stroop scores. I do the same thing for the sitting scores. And here we have the Stroop effects for every subject when they were sitting down. Save them in this variable. So now for each subject, we can subtract the sitting scores from the standing sorry, we can take the sit scores and subtract the standing scores. Now, if we were to look at this, what we're going to see here, um, this is a different score between two different scores. So this first score, this is for subject number one. It's a negative 65. So what does that mean? Well, we can see that when they were sitting, they had a Stroop effect of 58. This is the first value for that person. When they were standing, they had a Stroop effect of 124. So this means um, that this one subject went in the opposite direction than the means. So for example, this person 
uh, was more distracted uh, by the words it, uh, it potentially because they had a bigger stroop effect when they were standing compared to when they were sitting. The third person had a positive 115. So the third person, one, two, three. So this person had a 40 millisecond stroop effect when they were standing and one, two, three, 155 when they were sitting. So it seems like this person was, quote, paying more attention when they were standing. This is the diff this is the difference between the standing and sitting Stroop effects for every subject. These can be put into the variable Stroop differences. And um, for example, we could have put stand Stroop scores and sit Stroop scores into a paired sample t-test. Um, that would give us a result. Actually, let's just do that here. I'm going to call this paired results. Oops. Paired. Sorry. Paired results. I just want to show one thing. Let me pause this and write it all down. All right, here we have it. So I've put the stand Stroop scores, the sit Stroop scores, and I've set the paired t test to true. I want to print out the thing so we can do that here. And um, here we have it. Uh, let's also try it this way. So what I'm doing here is a one sample t-test. I've entered in the Stroop differences variable. This is a single vector. Of, and um, if there was no difference in the size of the Stroop effect between sitting and standing for each person, on average, these values should be zero. So we're testing that there is a difference that's greater than zero. And we can run that one and find the same value. So the t is 2.99. Here it's 2.99. The absolute value is the same. The degrees of freedom is the same. The p-value is the same. So we've done a t-test. And the t-test suggests that um, the mean difference of 22, so the, the way to interpret that is that the Stroop effect, when you're sitting, this difference is 22 milliseconds larger than the difference over here when you're standing. And that difference is unlikely to be due to chance according to this t-test. It has a 0 0.004 p-value. So what does this have to do with what the authors did? Well, when it comes to the uh, important effect right here, the most significant finding was the shrinkage of the effect when participants were standing. They reported an F value of 8.964 and a P value of 0 0.004. Notice the P value that we've obtained is the same, 0 0.004. Also, if you take the T value, um, 2.9941 that we found. And if you square this value, you get 8.96, which is the F value that they reported. And we'll learn uh, in upcoming labs that there's a relationship between T values and F values, namely T squared equals F. Okay, the next task was to make a plot. Our goal is to create this plot here. And I'm not going to go the whole distance in terms of making the colors the same, but let's just get a GG plot going where we can get all these means in here. So the first thing we need to do is look at the data and see that it is organized in wide format. And what we want to do is convert it to long format. So I'm going to use the tidy R package for this and we're going to use the pivot longer function to accomplish that goal. We'll take the data frame and set it into a, a pipe operator to do the pivot longer operation. We are identifying columns one to four as the columns that we want to move into a long situation 
and uh, this function will take some names. We're going to um, create a new column called congruency. That's going to say whether the value is congruent or incongruent, and another column called posture that will indicate whether the, the condition involves sitting or standing. I'm making use of a convenient aspect of the way the data was already coded. For example, I didn't do this, the authors did this. To represent the fact that this column was both a congruent condition and a standing condition, they consistently used an underscore operator to separate the two factor levels. And they also consistently used congruent or incongruent as the first word and stand or sit as the second word. So this function will recognize that the levels have been separated by an underscore, so we can list that here. Um, it's going to then convert all of the values to a column named RT. So let's see what happens when we do this. We've taken the original data frame, converted it to a long data frame, and each of these uh, values is now associated with a particular column, congruency and posture, and it's going to say uh, the levels for this value. So 892 came from right here in the congruent and stand condition, so it is associated with a congruent level and a stand level. Next, we want to generate the means for each condition. So we can do a set of dplyr filters or operations. We're going to group by the congruency and posture variables. And we're going to do a summarize operation. First of all, we will calculate the means and we'll also calculate the standard error of the mean. And I probably forgot to run these three libraries. And we're left with this table here. So we have the means for each condition, and we have standard error of the means that we could use to draw error bars. All right. Finally, I've got some code. We pump this into ggplot, and we will generate this plot here. And I will uh, just point out that all of this code can be reviewed by following the link to this solution uh, markdown document. Finally, we have a power curve. And what I've done here is copied the code from the lab where we discussed power curves for the first time and modified it slightly for this situation. If you uh, run into issues with this section, don't worry, we will be taking more time to go over power curves in the upcoming lab for the semester long project three. But here what we're going to do is generate a variable called effect sizes. And this variable will go from, uh, let's see, zero to 1.5 in steps of 0.1, indicating a variety of different effect sizes that could occur in this design. We're going to create a variable prop underscore significant. This is going to save the proportion of simulated experiments uh, that are found to be significant at the 0.05 level um, if the true effect size is any one of these different values. So the goal here is to run a simulation for each effect size. The simulation will involve 1,000 experiments. And each experiment, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the R norm function. And we're going to sample a value from something close to a unit normal distribution. So we'll set the standard deviation to one and instead of having a mean of zero, which would be normal, um, we will set the mean to be the effect size. 
So we will sample 50 values from this uh, normal distribution. And this would be like running 50 people in the experiment. We're going to test against a population mean of zero. So sometimes this t-test will involve testing a sample of zero from a mean against zero. That is when the effect size is zero. That, so our first set of replications will involve testing the null hypothesis. However, as we increase the effect size, um, we will be systematically increasing the difference between the expected value of zero to the effect size value, which could be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. Uh, so we'll be able to conduct this t-test a thousand different times and every time measure a p-value. And uh, at, the, at the end of conducting these 1,000 simulated experiments, we can ask the question, how many of the simulated experiments provided a p-value of less than 0.05? So let's do all of those things. It takes uh, 15 seconds or so. Then I've just created a summary data frame for each of the effect sizes, the proportion of simulated experiments that uh, had p-values less than 0.05. Finally, we've plotted the results here. And we can see that um, this design, and so remember this design effectively was a t-test with 50 subjects. And um, a design with that many subjects has a power curve that looks like this. Effectively, let's say right around here, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, when the effect size is around 0.7 or 0.8, a design will, of this nature will detect that effect at the 0.05 level with near 100% sensitivity or nearly 100% of the time that will occur. When the true sizes of effects are smaller than that, uh, then we have these different values. So this is a property of a design with 50 subjects. All right, so that's an overview of the solution for this assignment and we'll see you next week.